Thank you, Ali, for your effective and dedicated leadership as chair of this year's appointments committee. Uh, it is in fact become a year long process and uh, I think the results speak for themselves. It is now my pleasure to introduce Clem Darling, chairman of the 2021 SVS Nominations Committee. Uh, Dr. Darling. Thank you very much, uh, Ron, uh, President Dahlman. As with the appointments process, the composition work and selection process for the SVS officers has been evolving over the past several years. As members are aware, due to our bylaws changes approved by the membership, SVS held its first online election last year and 530 uh, of the SVS voter eligible members made their voices heard by voting for candidate for vice president and, chair and treasurer. Prior to online election, voting was restricted to those attending the annual business meeting and the highest vote total ever during that time was 300 votes. So right out of the blocks, we're moving. The online election has engaged more SVS members. This year will be the first time we have completed a full cycle in preparing for an election. And we hope that for, for more than 14% of the vo SVS voter eligible members will participate and vote. The singular vote of the SVS nominations committee is to select candidates in, to place in the ballot for each of the vacant officer positions. This year, there was only one vacancy to fill, the position of vice president. There is an open call for nomination that goes out in February 1st of each year. Nominations come to the nominations committee uh, for members at large, uh, self nominations or for nominations committee itself. The nominations co committee is composed of seven members and one liaison. The composition included three immediate past presidents of the SVS, an at-large member elected by the SVS membership, a member elected by the SVS strategic board, the vice chair of the community practice section, the chair of the SVS leadership development committee, and a liaison from the SVS Young Surgeons Committee. I'm pleased to note that this is the first time in SVS history the nomination committee was comprised of 50% female members, much like my practice. I wanna thank all of you, the members for the hard work this year. Uh, they all were, were very uh, vocal in their, in their thoughts and they did a superb job. The work of the nominations committee is to review and further improve the nominations and selection process each year. Select two candidates for each vacancy as required by bylaws, report the deliberations to the membership, which I am doing this evening, and then oversee the election and report the results when concluded, which will occur at the June 16th virtual annual business meeting. The el eligibility criteria qualifications and time commitments are made transparent in the nomination process. Here are the eligibility criteria for nominees to be considered for the SVS officer positions. We also make sure that all potential nominees are aware of the substantial time commitment and accept this responsibility. We have developed a set of desired leadership criteria we share with the potential nominees and that the nomination committee uses to discuss and filter nominations. This year, 23 nominees, nominations were received of which 12 completed the full nomination process, all of which were outstanding and could serve well in the level of leadership in the SVS now and in the future. I would mention that the ones who, the 12 that completed their applications, uh, there, were all, there were also many who dropped out uh, due to other circumstances. We thank all the nominees and encourage each of you to continue to aspire to lead the SVS. We need your support, we need your participation, and we need you to be leaders of the future. Now I'm, pl I'm pleased to introduce your candidates for vice president of the SVS and to have them join me in a brief introduction and uh, question and answer period. The first candidate to introduce is Dr. Joseph Mills, Baylor College of Medicine, Houston, Texas. Congratulations and welcome, Joe. The second candidate is Dr. William Schutz, Texas Vascular Association, Plano, Texas. Congratulations and welcome, Bill. We thought it would be great to invite the, uh, the candidates to the town hall for an informal chat so members get to know to them a, a little bit better. I will ask a series of questions and provide opportunity for each candidate to answer, alternating between candidates with regard to first response. Candidates, please keep your answers to no more than two minutes. 
Let's start with Joe. The uh, election ballot and SVS will be sending out background information to the two of you, but members may not know you. Please take two minutes to introduce yourself, where you trained, where you practice, and your career interests and goals. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. I'm Joe Mills. I was born in San Francisco, California. Uh, my dad was there. I'm part of the GI Bill going to college. I grew up, um, I went briefly to grade school in Arizona, but I grew up in the Washington, D.C. area and fell in love with medicine, ended up going to medical school at Georgetown, which at the time uh, I was a medical student, the tuition shot up to $10,000 a year, which doesn't seem like a lot now, but back then it was, and it was 20,000 by the time I finished. So I joined the Air Force in order to pay for my medical education, which led me to San Antonio. So I did my general surgery training at uh, Wilford Hall, Lackland Air Force Base in San Antonio, was, became interested in vascular surgery because of the mentorship of Jeb Hallett and Jay Robinson. They had a long vascular tradition there. And the year I applied for training in vascular was the year that programs became ACGME RRC certified. So there were a number of good programs that weren't certified yet, and I had to change my list. And I ended up randomly matching with John Porter in Oregon. So I did my vascular training there went back and finished my Air Force commitment, spent two years with Dennis Bandick at the University of South Florida, and then I, I loved the West and the Southwest, so I came back to Arizona when Vic Bernhardt retired, spent 20 years in Tucson, and I've been now in Houston for six years. Um, I love all of vascular surgery. I fell in love with vascular surgery when I was a third-year resident. I love the anatomy. I love the physiology. I love the vascular lab. Um, I'm a big advocate for our specialty, and I love training residents. I think the residents are our future. So I've spent a lot of my efforts over the years in training residents and being an advocate for our specialty, especially in the area of uh, chronic limb-threatening ischemia, which I think almost everywhere I've gone has been neglected. So thank you. Bill, the same question. The election ballot and SVS will be sending out background information for the two of you, but please tell like, to give us two in, minutes to introduce yourself where you trained, where you practice, and your career interests and goals. Thank you, Clem. Um, uh, first of all, I'd like to say that I'm, I'm humbled and honored uh, by this nomination. Uh, and I'd like to congratulate Dr. Mills as well on his nomination. I don't think y'all could have picked a better person. Um, and I'd like to thank the SVS for this opportunity as well. So I grew up in a uh, small county in Florida. Uh, we were ranked 60 out of 67th in uh, uh, you know, economic production because we were an agricultural county. But I was fortunate enough to uh, have a father's position and have privilege, so I was able to get out of Florida. And I went to college at Johns Hopkins University where uh, I thought I could play lacrosse and found out I couldn't. <laughs> so <laughs> I ended up uh, uh, leaving there to uh, go to medical school at Baylor in Texas where Dr. Mills is. And that was my first trip to Texas and I fell in love with Texas. Um, so, uh, you all know Dr. Ken Maddox, uh, and he, usually when he gives you advice, you better listen, but I, I didn't listen to him. I graduated from school in three years back when you could do that. So I could do my fourth year as a, as a paid intern, basically did my fourth year of medical school as an internship and a doing a rotating internship at Baylor. Then I went over to uh, UAB, uh, to do the uh, five years of general surgery. And I picked UAB because I needed, uh, I needed some discipline and I needed some structure. And they provided all of that very well, especially the discipline. Uh, I fell in love with vascular surgery when I was an intern there. Uh, I was rotating at the VA um, on my third rotation on the vascular service. And this nice vet had uh, ephemeral popliteal bypass done for claudication. And the, um, to be able to walk to the bedside the next day and feel a, a, a bounding pulse and a warm foot uh, was very impactful. And from that point on, I decided that that was the path I wanted to follow. I... Um, did my, I was fortunate to match with uh, the Baylor University Medical Center in Dallas for my vascular residency. And it's Dr. Jesse Thompson's, uh, you know, legacy uh, program. And uh, so that was my second tour to Texas. And once they got me back here the second time, they haven't been able to get rid of me. So I uh, entered private practice following my, uh, following my fellowship. And uh, seven years later joined uh, uh, and founded Texas Vascular Associates, the legacy group from Jesse Thompson. Uh, at, at TVA, we, um, we all basically do general vascular surgery. All of us are assigned to do everything, although certain people have found niches at which they excel at. 
So um, my focus was mainly for many, many years on, uh, on educating the residents and running the, uh, the uh, Rutherford uh, session, you know, Friday mornings at 6.30, week after week after week. Uh, I've also attempted to uh, climb that long steep hill of getting more clinical research into the community practice area and uh, trying to elevate the vascular game at all the hospitals I work at. My last five years, my main focus has been basically serving the society uh, and uh, trying to give back. Thanks, Clem. Uh, thank you very much, Bill. Um, now, um, Bill, this is, this is for you again. What, will keep, what keeps you up at night regarding the current and future practice of vascular surgery in our specialty? Well, um, actually, I'd like to say that uh, I sleep pretty good at night, <laughs> and there's, there's two reasons for that. I see Dr. Albarama laughing. Uh, they took me off the call schedule. Probably, it was probably a patient protection thing, but they took me off the call schedule last year. So, But really, uh, I think the society is in a great position with the, the leadership that's been in place uh, and, with, and working in collaboration with our executive director, Dr. Ken Slaw. I think uh, from a structural standpoint and a programmatic standpoint, uh, the society is really doing very well and continuing to improve year after year. If, if you have to pin me down on one thing that does bother me uh, or concern me, it would basically be in the area of advocacy. Uh, last fall, you know, we were staring at a precipitous drop in reimbursement for our services, uh, and it would have uh, been very hurtful, impactful, and could, could even be catastrophic for some of our members. Uh, however, you know, the PAC under the leadership of uh, Drs. Connolly and Mattis had a, did a great job, uh, had a, a banner year in raising money. Uh, we joined with the Surgical Coalition to, uh, to, to push back. Uh, we got our members involved and our members responded. And we were able to, to contribute to reversing those. And, but I don't think the battle's won. I think this is something that really could come back again and probably will. Uh, and I don't know if anybody remembers, but back in the 90s, anesthesia got hit with steep cuts. And their numbers of medical students going into that residency went down by 30%. In the first decade of 2000 of this century, the same thing happened to cardiac surgery, and it took them 10 years to recover. I think what bailed them out was going with the integrated residency. So I don't think now is the time to uh, take our foot off the gas. I mean, we, re we really need to keep pushing on this and we need to uh, uh, really focus on advocating for, for the value of what we do in our services. Thank Thanks. you, Bill. Joe, the same question. What is keeping you up at night regarding the current and future uh, practice of vascular surgery in our specialty? Well, I have insomnia, so I'm up at night a lot anyway. I'm a night owl if you know me and get emails from me at two in the morning. But, but I, I, I would echo some of what Dr. Schutz said, but I guess I'm a little more sanguine. I, I, this vascular surgery has been unbelievable to me in my life and that it's played, made a big part of my life. And I think I've had a huge impact on patients and I still love what I do. But I wanna preserve that career for the future vascular trainees and not just preserve what we used to do but protect and grow our practice. And I think my biggest concern is, is how do we do that? And I, I think the SBS has done an amazing job responding to, to different societal changes. Uh, the biggest things we did, I think, were one was be adopters of endovascular surgery, because I think we'd have been extinct if we hadn't done that. And the second thing was to become a primary specialty such that we could have a zero five applicant pool. And that probably has done more for our specialty than almost anything. So it immediately attracted a different pool of applicants. It doesn't seem to have shrunk the, uh, the uh, existing pool of people who go through general surgery, but I found the zero five people really um, exciting to teach. And I wanna, wanna pass them on a legacy and a future. So the concern I have is we have to brand ourselves better and we're starting to do that. We've made huge efforts, but I don't think we're close to what we should be doing. I think we need, I don't think people still realize despite the valuation project, despite our early efforts at branding, how hard vascular surgeons work for their patients and how we really are the ones that provide comprehensive care. So I think we can't pound that message enough. And I think we've got to get more attention from payers, hospital administrators, and we got to reach out and get more recruits into our specialty. And we don't want to become extinct. And I, I don't think we will, but I think that the things are more slippery than we think. I, I, I wouldn't relax at all. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. What do you think we need the SVS needs to do to best position its members to thrive in the future? 
Well, I think there's a lot of components to, uh, to the concept of thriving as a member. Um, probably in five different areas that uh, I think the members would uh, feel that uh, differently, but it would be important to them. And perhaps, you know, in one area would be professionally, another area would be educationally. Um, another area would be, you know, the emotional, physical aspect of it. And then uh, uh, servility, service, you know, and then last, as we've already discussed is advocacy. I think professionally, as far as that goes, um, uh, as Dr. Mills mentioned the branding campaign. That's just been an outstanding campaign. And I think the SBS needs to double down on that and, and continue those efforts that he's initiated and, and get in front of the patients with our branding, get in front of, front of students and let them know who we are. Um, uh, the intersocietal collaborations that have been established uh, over the last couple of years have been tremendous and we need to continue and, 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 and nurture and, and maintain those relationships so that as much as we can, we can speak as one voice uh, uh, when challenges come up. The um, other thing is there's a, lot of, um, there's a lot of just misinformation on the internet and, and I th I'd like to see the SVS become the home for good information. And that could take a couple of ways, either just really driving traffic to our website with a great patient facing page for information, or even developing a, an SVS seal where, where the SVS actually certifies that a website has um, uh, accurate and appropriate information for patients and they're not confused. And then the SG2 uh, SVS collaboration in which uh, we're collaborating uh, with this subsidiary of Vizient to actually go to systems and, sh and use the, um, the financial background of, uh, of SG2 and the knowledge background uh, clinically from the, the SVS uh, members to advise these systems on the value of a vascular service line and then what that should, should look like. Um, as far as uh, educationally, um, uh, you know, we've, we've got VAM back again. I hope everybody's registered that can, it's launched already. We need to get continue to work on the LMS and get uh, get that expanded, uh, as and uh, and get the PVI uh, course that Dr. Uh, uh, that was proposed launched. It got uh, you know misdirected by COVID, uh, and then we need to embrace new educational opportunities. Whatever uh, ideas we have or whatever opportunities arise, we need to just double down on those efforts to help our members. You know, the Wellness Task Force is tra is transitioning uh, into an into a new entity. Um, after the review this uh, next month, and we need to find a place for them so that they continue to, to fight back against burnout, and we can um, uh, uh, get the surgical coaching in place that they've offered, which is going to be a fantastic addition. Uh, and then uh, we've got the service opportunities through the new VISTA program, and Dr. Mills is, is part of that. Uh, his, one of his uh, projects was approved, so chance for our members to go out and, and do, you know, almost missionary work, but missionary work here, here in the States and not just make an impact on one patient at a time, but a community at a time. So I probably ran over, I apologize for that, but thanks, Clem. Thanks you. Uh, Joe, what can the SVS do to position itself uh, for the members for the future? Yeah, I think they're, they're doing it. If you look, for those of us that have been part of the SVS for a long time, maybe because we were junior, all we saw was a meeting a year with two societies that were magically split in the middle and some politics went on among a select group of people. And there's, as you saw from Dr. Ali Abarama's talk, the, the, the conscious effort to be more inclusive has really been there. And a number of social things drove that. But I think um, what I would like to figure out how to do is get more and more involvement from our trainees, from our trainees and our members. So we, we have people on committees, but I think a lot of the members don't even know how hard some of these committees work and all the things that they're, they're doing for our, for our specialty. So how do we get a more participation? And, and I think if we can convince the members that there's something in it for them, that, that it's gonna help their practice and help their future, they'll participate more. I, I, just to give an anecdote, when I, when I first went into surgery, I always tried to prepare for everything, operations. And if I had meetings and I was looking for resources, I would prepare better than anybody. I would make sure I had all the data to support my position and I would go in there and try to blow people out of the water. And I think, I hope I've matured. I think you still have to prepare. There's no substitution for that. But what I've learned as I've gotten older is that, that sometimes you can have a great vision, but the more people you get involved in that vision. So if you actually ask some younger people, what concerns you? How can I help your practice? What do you worry about every day? You, your vision gets better and gets refined. So I think if we can get 
all of our members to have the same vision. And this effort to have comprehensive vascular care define us is big, I think, because one of the things that really makes us different is we're not just proceduralists. So if we want to compete with those in our space, we have to be really good at procedures. But we don't want to lose the part of us that recognizes which patients aren't going to fare well with the procedure or don't need a procedure. And so we need to maintain that part of our heritage. So I would just, I would say the, uh, what we should do is try to keep expanding the involvement that we have of our members and try to be unified, try to gain unanimity of, of where we're heading and, and stick with our path. Thank you. Great, I'll go back. Uh, we're almost done. I wanna thank both of you for sticking with me. We only have two more questions and I'll go back to Bill. The world is changing around us in significant ways. How can the SVS best endure its evolving and, and staying current with the changing membership? Well, this is a perfect segue because today the, uh, the practice survey went out. So uh, I hope uh, everybody got that in their inbox. So beginning last fall, you know, the SVN sent out a, uh, a member census survey. And then today the SVS set out a, uh, a member practice survey. And the, and the strategy is to have two different surveys addressing two dis different areas of, uh, of um, our members. Uh, and then collect that longitudinally so we can keep, keep our finger on the pulse of the, of the membership and track how it changes. It only takes 10 to 12 minutes, so please, please fill it out. We'd really love to have a, a higher response rate, and I think this is a great way for the SVS to, to get that data, but we need your participation. Uh, lastly, um, I'd like people to try to use the SVS Connect platform when they can. Uh, there's a lot of other platforms you can go on with social media and, and many for, for vascular or other medical topics, but this is the one that the SVS monitors, and this is the one that we can react to, so please use that uh, so that we anything that is of import to you can be raised to a high level pretty quickly. Um, the last thing I would say that um, the SVS needs to have a philosophy <clears throat> when, um, when uh, challenged with change, that as long as it fits our core values and purpose, then we should strongly consider that change. As Dr. Mills mentioned, this is a drastically, drast drastically different society than when I came out of training. In fact, when I came out of training, I, I, wouldn't admit, I wasn't even eligible to join our society. So things have come a long, long way. Um, so I would say um, uh, as far as, uh, as change goes, we need to embrace change. We need to be comfortable being uncomfortable. Thanks, Lynn. Thank you very much. Uh, Joe, the world is changing around us in significant ways. How can the SBS best ensure it is evolving and stay current with the changing membership? Yeah, I, I think two things. One is that we need to keep defining ourselves and stick with that vision if it's the right vision. I think we're on the way to doing that. And the other is just engagement. I, I, I think that um, the town halls have been a great, I think during the initial part of COVID, they were awesome because we had no other way to get together. And they went from kind of stilted meetings to meetings where people actually interacted to where after a while it was almost like being live. But I think maybe we need to figure out how to do that differently because it still is hard for a lot of people to participate. Some of the town halls have had, you know, we have 3000 members. I think one of the biggest town halls had maybe 300 sign up. We really want more people to participate. So I wondered, if you think about how democracy works, the old fashioned way that they still do in parts of New England and the way they often do in Holland is you sit down in a room and you talk through a problem until you solve it. And that's not the way our democracy works in our country anymore. And it's not really the way the SVS works. And I wonder if we should break down these mini town halls into little regional ones, invite um, local people that aren't well known nationally, but are in the trenches doing what we do every day. And, they may have a different experience than somebody at a giant hospital, or they may run to three small hospitals and they may need help. So how do we help all of, all of our members in different environments flourish? And we may get really good ideas from people that you wouldn't have thought would have good ideas and you won't know unless you ask them. So I, one thought I had would be to break things down into smaller pieces and try to, try to get more input. Um, but you know, the problem with the future is the, the predicting the future is it hasn't happened yet. So it's always difficult. I think vascular surgery has proven really agile. I mean, there's no question we've done some pivots that really rescued our specialty and made it um, even greater than it was. I mean, if I think about my everyday clinical activity and what I do now compared to what I did when I started training, they're not even close to the same thing, but we treat the same patients and similar patients. 
So anyway, I think continued engagement and maybe smaller interactive sessions to get more people to contribute. That's how we adapt to change. Because sometimes you don't hear about change. It, it happens in different parts of the country, right? When I came to Houston, it astounded me that vascular surgery didn't really have a separate identity in most of Houston. It was all CV surgery. Finally, after five years, we don't get called the CV service anymore. It's taken, taken a while. And there, I'm sure there's pockets that everywhere. So anyway, I think that, that that's the answer. Okay, final question, and I'll start with Joe. If elected, what will you be doing in the next two years to prepare yourself for the role of president? Um, first thing is listen. I think I've gotten much better at that as I've gotten older. And um, even when you, there's, Spence Taylor used to give a great talk. So he's, as far as I know, he's the only vascular surgeon that's founded a medical school. Um, and he, he gave a just great talk. We actually got a coach. So most of us that are, have been in leadership positions kind of feel like, why do I need a coach? But there were a lot of politics involved in starting the medical school. And he used the comparison of most really good surgeons that are leaders are kind of like band leaders. You know, we have this Sousa march and I know how it's supposed to be played and let's follow me and we're going to do this. And that works in a small setting, but a really good leader is a shepherd. So you may have some idea where the target is and when you're trying to get there, but you, you kind of guide people gently. And the, I guess the difference from the shepherd is that the the flock in this setting is the SPS membership, and they should have a lot more input. I mean, in the end, the sheep are going to go where they're supposed to go at the end of the day, right? But a good leader, you may, you may take off people off in a, in, a, in a general direction, but exactly where you end up should be guided by the wisdom of the whole group. And I actually truly believe in that. I, I, even my research studies, I'll send stuff by junior people, but everything I do now, I try to get multiple layers of insight and input and it's amazing how you won't have thought of something until you ask for somebody's input. So if you can set up an atmosphere where people want to give input and won't be shamed for giving it, and doesn't mean you get your way every time, but at least you're listened to, I think that's that's huge. So to me, that's um, what I would do for the next two years is listen a lot. And I would try really hard to get into different parts of the country. I'm pretty familiar with the West and the South, um, but figure out what the different, um, problems are for people in different settings. And then we can truly represent our whole society. Thank you. Thank you. And to you, Bill, if elected, what will you be doing in the next two years to prepare yourself for the role of president? Well, it's interesting. You know, I've been uh, on the executive board for three of the last four years. So I've actually had the privilege of, of watching that transition occur um, several times now. And it's apparent to me now that the onboarding process is actually pretty well set, and it's a great process as as for the vice president to move into the president elect to move into the presidency. Uh, you're just thrown right into it right off the bat. There's executive board calls uh, every two weeks uh, where the the business is of the society is done. There's also leadership calls every week um, that the vice president is on to uh, get into the get into the weeds right off the bat, and then. Uh, and then uh, the, um, there, there, there are other uh, calls that you can be on as well. I'd like to be sit on the communications call that Dr. Amy Reed hosts uh, to be, you know, up to speed with what's going on there. And then um, the other thing is I already do have a little, uh, pretty good background after, you know, the last four or five years of how the society really functions with the councils, committees, and the other task forces and uh, what projects we've had and what projects uh, we're, we plan. You know, we have, there's like a, I'm gonna hope this shows up. I don't know. Got kind of a printout here of like the, this grid of 10 page long grid of the projects that have been completed and the projects underway. So you kind of see that rolling along every every two weeks uh, as you have your EB call. So you'll be absorbing that. The um, uh, other thing is, as president elect, you uh, have a couple obligations. Uh, one is to uh, run the um, spring uh, strategic board of directors meeting, at which time the platform for the following year comes out. And that turns out that's going to be your platform as president. So, you, you know, you'll be heavily involved in, in how that de develops and then is implemented. The other thing is the Stanley Crawford Critical Issues Forum is something uh, you're responsible as president elect. And you obviously need to start that well in advance. And I've already thought that, you know, a great topic would be to address the, you know, regional uh, vascular emergency care uh, and, and, and use that forum uh, to, you know, define the problem and hopefully uh, point towards some solutions. And one of the solutions that uh, uh, has that I've been thinking about for a long time would be for the SVS to start a program similar to ACLS or ATLS, TLS called um, 
you know, AVLS or um, acute vascular life slash limb salvage. And it would be uh, for all providers that are faced with uh, a vascular emergencies and, and provide the, that knowledge that fills in the void that we see every day when we get called with an emergency uh, and give them some skills to help, you know, get some better upfront care before that patient is sent to us. I think that would uh, serve our patients. I think it would serve our society. Uh, I think it would fit in nicely with our branding, you know. Uh, so uh, that's that's one of the things that uh, I would be working on during that uh, uh time period leading into presidency. Thanks. Okay. Uh, thank you, Joe and Bill, for giving the SVS members a chance to get to know each of you. And I want to thank the SVS members for all the work they do, the tremendous work they do for our patients uh, and to be part of the best uh, profession in the entire world. And I would just, last thing I want to say is vote, vote, vote. It starts at the end of this meeting and goes for a week and we need to have your participation. Uh, Ron, I'm happy to send it back to you.